we'd like to thank uh, the following organizations and groups for their support. So AZ Cares, which used to be Arizona Commission on the Arts, Poets and Writers, the U of A Poetry Center, Chax Press, the U of A English Department, and the Arizona Quarterly. And we'd also like to thank our many generous individual donors. This has been a tough year for nonprofits, and we really, really appreciate your help. So patrons include Charles Alexander, Mary Ellen Bartholomew, Charles Bernstein, Cynthia Hogue, Jason Labak, Jason Lagapa, I'm sorry, Joan Larkin, Judith LaFay, Cameron Louie, Lisa Martin, John Melillo, Cynthia Miller, Tenny Nathanson, Nancy Quigg, Stephen Romaniello. Will Stanier, Richard Tavener, and David Weiss. And our sponsors, Karen Brennan, a Cutthroat a Journal of the Arts, Reed Dixon, Lynn Finger, Anna Lambert, Little Red Leaves, Don Pendergast, Heidi McDonald, Barbara Miller, Jameson Noenix, Jenna Osman, Anthony Sovak, Mariah Starr, and Susan Thackeray. Uh, if you're interested in helping us with a donation, you might visit our website, which is www.pogartstucson, all one word, .org, and you'll find our membership and support links there. You can just check out our website for upcoming events and for links to past events. Um, yeah, you know, I know times are hard. Um, I'd like to announce our two upcoming readings for the for the year. On March 20th, we have Jeannie Huving and Jamie McCarty. On April 17th, we have James Sherry and Najima, who's a wonderful jazz singer, uh, performing with Eric Matchett. And both of those will also be 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time and will be again virtual via Zoom. You can visit our website and you can RSVP and get the link as you did tonight. Okay. Uh, at the conclusion of the reading, we'd like to invite all of you just to stick around and have a short conversation, a short talk, and this will be hosted through the same Zoom link, so you can just stay. And finally, two, two announcements or two, two, two things to point out. Um, we intend POG to be a safe and inclusive and, and happy space for everybody. If anybody should feel otherwise, however virtual we are, please reach out to one of our directors and maybe I could ask everybody <laughs> to raise their hand who's a director, Charles and Cynthia and David and Cameron. And Lisa is here too, hi Lisa. And also we wanted to, uh, to, to acknowledge the First Nations and the native plants and native animals. And the fact that Tucson is uh, built over a history that maybe gets forgotten and we shouldn't forget it. Tucson's the most uh, continuously inhabited place in North America and everything that we do today rests upon ancestors and people who were here before. So with that, let me turn it over to Charles who'll be introducing Tacey. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Tacey M. Atsuki is Diné of the Senahabili or Sleep Rock people and born for Tanetani, the Tangle people. And it's from Cove, Arizona. Um, I tried to look into Cove, Arizona and it's the kind of size that it's not listed as a town even, it's just called a populated place. Okay. <laughs> and it seems to be one of the most beautiful places in Arizona too, okay. north of Canyon de Chez. Her work has appeared in Poetry, Epic, Kenyon Review Online, Prairie Schooner, Crazy Horse, New Poets of Native Nations, Poetics for the More Than Human World, and a myriad of other publications. Her first mm -hmm. book, Rain Skull, was published by the University of New Mexico Press in 2018. She is a recipient of the Truman Capote Creative Writing Fellowship, the Corson mm -hmm. Browning Poetry Prize, Morning Star Creative Writing Award and the Philip Freund Prize. She has bachelor's degrees from Brigham Young University and the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, and an MFA in Creative Writing from Cornell University. She directs the Navajo Film Festival, is poetry judge for the Egg Tooth Editions Chapbook Contest, and is a member of advisory council for BYU's Charles Red Center for Western Studies. She's also a board member for Light Scatter Press of Salt Lake City and a founding member of the Intermountain All Women Hoop Dance Competition, 
at This Is The Place Heritage Park. <laughs> she is a PhD student in creative writing at Florida State University. And uh, currently she lives in Peru. Uh, and in some sense, she just arrived there yesterday. So we're glad to have her here tonight. Um, yes, peripatetic. Arizona, Utah, New Mexico, New York, Florida, and Peru. It may be her travels and dwellings and dancings in multiple places that give her an expansive view of what place means, what dwelling means. Mm -hmm. Her movement is also in time. And when she writes, and this is a quote, tonight, though we're walking in years between us, a candle brings us a cloud closer to a deeper hue, and we can handle any breeze that turns us inside out. I think we get a sense of multiple dimensionality, a prodding perhaps, not only to endure, but to do so here, there, now, then, and in physical and psychological depths and spaces we may not have yet imagined. Yes, bring us a cloud closer. Please welcome Casey Etzeke. Thank you so much for that introduction, Charles, and thank you for the invitation. Um, excited to be here and just pray that my internet will <laughs> remain stable. Um, uh, um, so I'm going to start off reading from my book, Brain Skull, and this is the first poem. Snake white, owl white. When I say my cheek fell, I mean bone. Gliding pill sunken, I mean it hides in rain in a skylit cell, swelling. This is me fallen together separated from her, a mistelling of female warrior who split in two, who pulled from her gut well a lumpy snake, pale with a scaling tongue, word slit. I've heaved her pang, her yell at the snap of his tail, they drop into words at the end, a quell to the flood, floodline of a uvula, face, cheek pouch, high shell veins, Birds swim silver in sky, an owl drops to dwell with me, gapes, it's death. I step back, I can't tell how he rises and dives at me, then turns flight just before my head when I tell you, this is where bone rises to white, I mean tomorrow, a minute later, dive well. Night Song to the Gorge Dwellers. With no fire, you offer nothing. Say, a body found, Fall Creek Gorge, eventual. It is meaning to happen, meaning to say, dear fellow. It is with deep name, 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 strung like hair, water strands made old, made white, too close to dark. Second tragedy, fall creek throat, repeated, repeated, loss, thirst in almanac of the gorges, litany of wrists, look down at your wrists, down here where the thick laps the lips, where you haven't been taught to pull yourself out of the plunge pool and look for fire, look for rings shifted to your thumb and forefinger, there like vapor wrapping you in strips. In this falling moment, cities sink into the depths, drown the earth, face carried up and away in the current of a whirlwind where water and mountains hide in deep blue. What faces bring? A reservoir filled, following the night when day fell into day, soon followed by night into night, to night, thrice with no moon, thrice with no flame, kept in the thick 
thick. So I'm going to start um, reading some sonnets and um, kind of got on this sonnet kick for the past, I don't know, eight years or so. So hope you guys enjoy um, the rest of this. I think they're all going to be sonnets. There's a couple from Rain Scald here and then mostly from uh, my new manuscript that I'm working on. Marked. We ripple into sediment. They wrote as though we are grays staggering the river bottom milky hard and thrown about not stained pebbles pieced together in the form of beats curved and edged by strikes our light catches even in shards from gravel a channel sparks face and heart they think charred skin and charcoal don't shine for a time ignited with wool tinder. This all leaves a deep hue isolated. It's just now sunrise and silt sinks flint that once took the shape of a heart. Here we lie like pores of an arrowhead awaiting the day when stone turns to water. Salt Lick. I left myself a heifer to her salt block to carve hip bone. Coaxal deposits tinge dry in the nape's shelf, a jar of salt. I lost myself in granules, prone now to live life with a chiseled tongue, worn rare to the tip. It feels like that, like everything needs salt. Even Lipoma tastes better adorned at the mouth of a gorge in thick chrysalis bling. I folded myself calmly, hands in V rush and ready to dive, just a sleek dip into beef stock. For a moment, a pastoral hush. This is me mooing. Death comes heavy. Puck marks squirm ringworm ribeye. See the pooling grease. What's left of me? Ribbon of fat. How it spools. So these are from my new manuscript. Um, tentatively named at wrist. Sonnet for my wrist. I tend to mistake your ribs for a hand towel. It hangs on a nail above the wash bowl, the hand towel ripped. There's something wearing about the end curve of thread. When I sleep, I keep my palms open. Verve, we were lovers in a field of gray. In Navajo, we say something wrote. I'll radical when you hurt me something close, even you waft. It's best I tether, forget flyaways I plucked. My bones, they lie to me like fray, like gaunt. I don't crawl back for fragments, even a spinal cord of sinew. It's not going to close. You rope me from stray to grip. It's all for naught. I'm born for my father, tangle people, our mouths in webs tonight, my wrists part and you chase my insides until they dangle into pieces. Chafe. For someone husky like me, it's grained at the inner thighs, like rubbing corn tassel between your thumb and fingers until it looses, or even just bumping it with a thick stick, it loses pollen when it's time. I know how stalks loosen. I've seen dad tie them when they lean too far, almost to the ground, their brace roots exposed from wind or too much water, their gentle rustles in wind or breath, 
their deep bends at the knees. Once they depended alone on rain. Once they sprouted silken firm. Closer we are to being round until the turns of girdling, until the drop to humus, no longer embarrassed at such a thin weave, legs, skin, leaf, limb. Round our wrists for first man. We swing like shawls about the shoulders of brides spread open in a field of snow. Though it's just yet fall, leaves bob red foretell the absence of voice at eventide. Once we sat in the current of a longhouse, lulled in memory of a stew that warmed an ice monster. I raked the story for your elbow and warmth a message so petty. Answer, I missed you when you left to carve a snow snake tunnel upon throwing my tendon caught in the eddy of creation. I could no longer lift logs to stack. This was love in the saying, I could only follow your collar in snow so far. Bark, I braided round our wrists round back. One of these days you will find me under the white where autumn floats, rounding out the soles of our feet where the arcs of our breaths hold. These are all like failed love poems, just so you know. <laughs> Not failed love poems, failed love. Poems about failed love, yeah. <laughs> okay. Out of Star. Float in to apologize, the first and easiest, our hands. To purge the pulse I felt right here on my tongue in the buds of each petal, the pillowcase I hand-stitched. He said he'd use it to pass through clouds on his way. One morning he buoyed me with his tide and rock like something out of a summer blow along the shores or a boy that winds through Russian olives at sunset I've seen. I've floated that river over and over and back into child. The morning I drove from the sun then walked into it. How could he not feel this were for him when I lifted his couch? Inside, out, and even when I uttered every morning, at every rill, for every watercourse that never turned out in voice nor text. Why in the final sunrise of our breaths could he not see the still as gold rift from my eyes into his? Still life, Morrow. I think they know about every leaf I'd catch to peel from my tongue. It spoke to how good I was at being alone. This morning I sit in the still kitchen, rude by autumn passing me outside. Still, I cut into my omelet. Turn off the static, my therapist says. Taste what you swallow. Inside I feel water burst from the baby Bella's I wish I were staring at a still life, a bowl of cactus fruit maybe, or rotted watermelon, and not this wintry scene of the road I've just taken. In it rises our breath to the lone mountains as layers of rain gloss us abundantly. Apricot Lament. Just when he thought to loom the backyard for bud and just when he came to admire or thought to dote over. Already he ruse stick thin arms whose petals brave the late. 
whose middles freeze, we've gone without. All Ramos till now, empty skirts anxious to round back for. It's the fourth year lips have gone without any such. Already hips full of leaves and none. Else years by last the loan, it splat behind. My back it came to ache as the rake clawed at. We've gone into partial burn without even. No matter for bloom, the seasons no longer allow. The trouble with doting is, the trouble with doting over blossoms is. In a swollen tub of Ruth, wanting nothing but his. Lace sonnet. Like this vein webbed glass, me a ribbon so rain, so pearl in mass, or my wedding white. I see you at the crown of my crux, light, and petals veil, blown this fringe, this leaf let face, let lips drown the way. Your coral neck, it zips at the back, up and down my hand cup. Candy Dish Sonnet. Already the heart-shaped dish on my end table lies combed bare, long strips dug out. A cleaning out. A scratch and grain table scraps lain out so comely, meaning to love or hold cacao and almonds, those striae of protein, a deep cut. I tell the butcher, I'll take the heart as soon as you can give it. A gift to the first child I come across. Crows and trees lean in with every crumple the butcher paper makes in my hand. Soon the branches will be naked as bone china and we like the skeletal sky reach out for any sweet filling. Each drip drop chocolate kiss staining our fingers. Gown Sonnet. Somewhere in some town USA, there lies a bride in a trunk, in an attic, in a house. In a tangled mess of lace and limbs, a douse of clouds floating across the landscape of her eyes. Even now, her lace has begun to curl like eyelashes on a night ready for batting. And her blouse see-through as a ghost. But it isn't that blouse she now rests in. It's a gown her mother died in small snakeweed in warm waters weeks before her wedding day. The bride wasn't found until years later when a child in a veil crowned with dandelions and mums playing hide and seek broke the latch and lifted the wooden lid up unearthing a beautiful head of hair still done up. River Sonnet. Water levels have bled out like it had just bitten its lip and was about to swell, then rip. Had I paid better attention to drought, listened more to the stars and stayed with mounting clouds, I'd have let go of the knot swing hanging above the slow life flow beneath my legs. I'd have 
prayed to forget all the times he came to me, but not wanted me. How fast it rises, carrying plumes of pang in undercurrent, swirls of sediment and silt around my knees, the dragging stalks and leaves of irises. How pathetic they look, breaking in torrent. The night my wrist broke. They came ready for blood. The night snow fell gently, so gently I mistook it for female. My dad raised me better than this. Five male EMTs peered into the light of my truck. Their eyes scanned every dark crease of my body. It was cold. That night, my truck was a cage protecting me still. I could hardly exhale. I'm sorry. I'm crying. All but one looked away, allowing me to cry for a moment longer, as though I were one of them. I kept my right wrist close to my chest a pain so clear I could see every empty cavity in my rib cage, heart thumping like a bass guitar, hand strumming to the sound of a girl wailing. Okay. And let's see. I'm gonna finish with A February snow. I get like this when it precipitates, fall like salt. Muscles in my back tear to the point of floating, bearing flakes. They come heavy now, lacking grace, exposing the weight my collarbones carry. The wind can only lift so much with its song. Snow is a blessing. Its color amplifies silence so you can hear every crunch or offering of self. A sugar cookie wrapped in napkin. I thought I knew love in every drag of the tongue across icing, sparkle in glaze. Thought I went waiting into stars pulling my dress up to my knees. Alas, all that's here is a field of snow and a napkin to cleanse my lips of any leftover sweetness. I ate that cookie for days until I fell brittle. It's the time of year when I sink into my armchair, into threads of branches gone bare. It's tough to tell in this scene if it's birth or dying time. All I know is it's the season when wind comes crying like a baby whose head knocks a pew during the passing of the sacrament. That silence, her long inhale filling with pain. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Tracy. Hey, that was marvelous, my goodness. I'm so glad I had a chance to hear you today. Um, I'm gonna have uh, Fareed Matuk uh, introduce Brendan whenever you guys are ready. Tracy, thank you for those beautiful poems. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Brandon tonight, Brandon Shimoda. So on Inauguration Day 2017, so many of us in Tucson found ourselves grateful that we could hear from Brandon. He gave a talk that day at the Jewish History Museum and Holocaust Center to a crowd that included Jewish descendants of Holocaust survivors, migrant rights activists working along the border with Mexico university faculty and students, Pascua Yaki, Tohono O'odham, and Diné peoples, 
public school students, as well as survivors and descendants of survivors of Japanese migrant and Japanese American incarceration. Brandon's talk related how the white architects of Japanese incarceration working inside the US federal government shared resources and intelligence across the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the War Relocation Authority. He told the complicated story of camps for internment situated within larger camps, reservations, without drawing cheap equivalencies between the experiences of people with claims to those stories. He then linked the past to recent and present administration's incarceration of migrants and asylum seekers. I still remember how Brandon guided dialogue among audience members with painful histories and sometimes conflicting perspectives. Like the museum's permanent exhibit that connects his, the history of fascist laws in Germany to dehumanizing policies in this nation in this time. Brandon guided that audience to discern the ways these histories are part of larger and entangled stories that are right now trying to foreclose our entangled moments. Entanglement is key here. I'm no longer surprised when I meet writers, artists, or prison abolitionists who share that their work has been supported, often for years, by a deep and evolving conversation that Brandon has maintained with them. Those conversations often make their way into Brandon's poems. That porous collective quality makes his poems read to me like a record of an attention that, though trained, as he says in a recent interview on the tremendous darkness of our moment, is still willing to be surprised, still willing to receive, still willing to be changed, even to be carried. It would be easy enough for a writer of Brandon's talent to process his studies on incarceration and systemic oppression into poems that would seek attention and sympathy from liberal US poetry readers by offering a pathos that would be familiar and amenable to their sensibilities, but he doesn't. In the same interview, Brandon is asked what he finds himself returning to deliberately or not. In response, he shares an inscription Asip Mendelstam wrote to Anak Matava on the inside of a book he gave to her. Quote, flashes of consciousness in the forgetfulness of days. Brandon goes on to note that how events that upon their occurrence seemed important in his life recede, while what persists are flashes of consciousness, such as those that Mandelstrom refer referenced. A book like Brandon's The Desert seems a record of such flashes stretched across an entire lifetime's focused attention. One of its gorgeous sections, Gila River, spans testimony of incarceration survivors, myth, present day observations, and delivers these various strands into resonance with a remembered quotidian conversation between the poet when he was a child and his grandmother. I don't mean to evoke any of the various but familiar enough ways many of us exercise a poetics of fragmentation. Fragmentation is fine stuff, just like cohesion can be. What Brandon does in his poems doesn't move along that continuum though. I think it's about where he's looking, where he's setting his sights. In a book of new poems, all that beauty Fred Moten writes about seeing through things as appearances, lenses, not like open caskets through American pictures, but like disappearance. When disappearance ain't just vanishing, but radical indivisibility that opposes in radical presence the merely apparent. By looking into and through the darkness and even corresponding with the ghosts of that darkness, Brandon's fragments surprise because they do coalesce into a radical presence that registers the indivisibility at the heart of Moton's concerns. In corresponding with Brandon, we were already indivisibly making a book. Taking a walk with Brandon among ruins, we were already indivisibly in his classroom. Listening to Brandon share his research, we were already indivisibly inside and indebted to one another's struggles. It's not a debt we're supposed to pay. We trade our flashes of consciousness without settling accounts. 
We trade flashes of consciousness because those flashes light circuits of entanglement that were always our proper nation, a place beyond the reach of any state. Try to look where Brandon is looking. In his poems, that far horizon is already behind us and we're home. Please welcome Brandon Shimoda. Thank you so much for Reed. Um, I love you. Fareed is one of the only people I've seen in the last year, <clears throat> for real. Um, thank you so much to Pog and especially to Tacey. I was, I was wondering, I was thinking about failed love poems and I was wondering if it was easier or more enjoyable to write a failed love poem as opposed to a, a successful love poem? Um, maybe I should have saved that question for later, but anyway, that was on my mind. Um, I'm sitting outside, so there's a nice wind tonight. If, if the wind picks up and drowns out my voice, then I guess that was intentional. Okay, I'm gonna read um, a series of dreams interwoven with poems from a new book. And the book is the, is the sequel to my last book, which was called The Desert. Um, it's basically just things that I've written while living in Tucson. The book is called Hydra Medusa or give away the one you want. I hope I'm at least partly visible, but only, but only partly. I had a dream last night that a scream did not need a hill to gather speed to reach the people. I had a dream last night that the war fit on the tip of a finger I had a dream last night that a rainbow was burning. The fire consumed the rainbow. The embers shined like mirrors in the sun. I had a dream last night that a man gave a performance in which he visibly aged. When the performance began, he was young. By the end, he was old. The stage was large. The space for the audience was small, no seats. The man walked to the foot of the stage and said in a low voice, my house. I had a dream last night that I met a woman made of bricks. She took herself apart brick by brick and became a pile of bricks. I had a dream last night that my teacher was sitting on the edge of the roof of an old building. She had just given us our final exam which was to speak extemporaneously for 10 minutes on a single subject, any subject. I went last. I closed my eyes and said, someday the earth will become the moon, beaten, abused, extinguished, and yet indispensably radiant to some other life. Then I stopped. I looked around the room, all my classmates were frowning. Then the teacher opened the window. It occurred to me while I was having this dream that a teacher is someone who instills in others the conviction that no matter how close you get to the edge, you will not fall. I had a dream last night that I was launched without parachute or wings straight up into the sky where I rose beyond the clouds. At the point where the momentum ended and it seemed certain that I was going to fall back to earth, a ledge appeared. I put my hands on the ledge and pulled myself up. There was on the ledge an arrangement of noodles. Not much, but I was ecstatic. I was not going to starve in the sky. But I also knew that I was not going to return to earth and that the noodles were my only consolation. Suddenly, no amount of sky was enough. I was choking. Earth looked from the ledge like a fragment of coral broken off of a reef. Not only was I not going to return, there would be no reason. 
Everyone I knew and loved was already dead by virtue of the fate of endless sky, of having been born, of choking on a coral fragment and getting used to it. I love the ones who make of poems, writes Fareed Matuk, in one of my favorite poems of his, Arts and Craft. I love the ones who make of poems, he writes. I love the ones who make of poems a resonance, not lonely or owned, but opening at our shoulders to sense one another having been before vacating detachment. And still unwelcomed in the words, I'll pronounce what comes my conviction. I know a snake holds me in the dream water by letting me see it. I know when I fill with breath enough to fold into everyone already here we float and every inch of altitude surprises. I had a dream last night that I boarded a long distance bus traveling very fast through a bright sizzling landscape. I walked to the back of the bus and there in the very last seat, surrounded by hundreds of pastel colored stuffed animals was Fareed Matuk. I had a dream last night that Fareed and I were sitting at a long cafeteria table. He turned to me and whispered, I've been making wooden instruments. He had one in his lap. It was exquisitely precise. He pulled a carving knife out of his shirt and placed it on the table, then handed me the wooden instrument. Then my friend Ko and I split the anchovies. Ko had never had anchovies before, but he did not ask, what are they like? They are like, if you are prone to happiness, anchovies will not bring you happiness, but like anchovies climbing up rainbow falls exist and will accompany what already exists in you. If you are prone to unhappiness, only the rainbow falls will remain charged with the anchovies lack of endeavor. Ko and I stood among poisonous flowers talking about the foreseeable extinction of Hakodate. The fish are leaving, Ko said. The squid are lonely. Ko's grandparents will die. Their house will be sold. New footfalls on the steep stairs will be the sound for a little while of grandparents entrenched in their absence. Snow will emerge to tide over the absence as challenging death, working with knowing death's schedule. Then my friend Sophia invite us, invited us over for pancakes. There was on the wall of her kitchen a family portrait of a baby. It was not that the baby was holding the family together. There was only the baby. The family was baby. And a sage plant in the yard was dead. It had died, possessed death as a history. We gave Sophia an enormous, enormous pomelo. You should bury it in the yard, we said, in tribute to the sage. The pomelo became, in Sophia's hands, a sponge for the roots, eating everything lost now in the ebony magnet, the primal waves of waiting, lifting the need for herbaceousness, as a father's head is always adjacent to a large yellow fruit beneath the ground. It is light green, a tomb flower is real. Then I invited my friends Ko and Sophia one night to the mountainous trees. The sensation of separating from gravity as real as the orbit and the starlessness of space. We sat in the grass where the free fall ends and talked about our fathers. The grimness, the sadness of our fathers. Our fathers whirling around in empty kitchens, appealing to love spun into solemn cocoons, floating there yet unable to reach out and touch. These men absorbed the moon. The earth held its seminar in the shade. Our fathers pressed their foreheads to black holes at the, at the base of mountainous trees. They were as close to the freshness of nature as anyone in the nightmare of rivers. Then I visited a bookstore in the woods. A creek was filled with leaves. Reflections were not trustworthy, but still accurate, medicinal, predictive. The proprietor was Japanese in his 70s. The bookstore was his house. The bookstore did not end. I was in his living room, looking at his family photos. I was in one, I was a baby. But that was as long as it lasted. There was a glass menagerie. Spies, I thought. I remember one book. Stories set in Shimoda, the Shimoda story by Oliver Statler. 
no, no, the baby was not me. Babies live in craters covered in grass or in bomb shelters. The man sat at a large cafeteria table. What is your name? I asked. He wrote it in cloud-like letters. They were practically bubbles. Da Nagasaki, Nagasaki da. I wrote my name next to his. Da Shimo, Shimoda. He was not impressed. The woods were filled with throats disintegrating at the base of trees, emitting the smoke of spores released from a mushroom, crushed by hand. I wondered if I could live there with the man. When I got to the end of the hallway and enter the cafeteria, I will lose myself, but will I still be loud to myself? I will not be following anybody. I will be once again nameless and insignificant and without fingerprints. I had a dream last night that all the consonants in my name were silent. I had a dream last night that an unsent postcard was crawling with small insects. I had a dream last night that I was in a cult. Cult life consisted of sitting at a long cafeteria table in the ruins of a Japanese American concentration camp and applying lines of whiteout to eight and a half by 11 sheets of sandpaper. Straight lines, vertical. But I could not get the whiteout to cooperate. My lines were uneven. They wandered and bled. I was given demerits, then handcuffed and escorted to the edge of the camp. I had a dream last night that Lisa and I were in the woods, admiring the trees, when we noticed that they all had moons hanging from them. An indication of bad weather, Birds abandon their nests and take shelter inside the moons. Then it began to rain and did not stop. It stopped raining, then started again. The rain slid underneath the skin that held the desert together and the people together. It rained for the span of each lifetime of everyone who was living here or found themselves living here or unable to live any longer here but unable to leave. It began to rain six feet away from where it was not raining and did not stop. I woke my father and asked him if he wanted to share an orange with me, but he could not hear me or the rain, but he could hear me sucking the orange, he said, or so he said, it began to rain. But who can feel it? Who cannot hear it? Then a bell rang all night. It rang all night. No one slept but listened to the bell, framed by empty urgency. No one could be saved by a dream. Everyone plunged into the least suggestive ether. The bell was murmuring, was a seam torn open. It was windy. The fence flew back and forth. The bell held to the world by a bookmark, blank, banging against the skin of its echoes. The bell stopped was regrouping the soul over the neighborhood, crushed against the fibers of a nest. It bled, it bled into the riverbed. It flailed and yet without supplication, slipped out of the skin it blew against. Who is it? Who is at the gate? Who is at the door? Someone who is hungry, who wants me to be hungry, who brought with them death notifications. Who made it back? I cannot believe I made it back. I cannot believe that I went anywhere and made it back. I should not have made it back. I feel like I should not have made it back. I put water on for tea for them. I waited for the water for them. Whose face was it in the steam? Is no water, no steam, no tea for them, no rest, no sleep. I kept them awake in the middle of the night, was mourning for them. They kept asking in the form of those closest with voices, Happy New Year. Is Happy New Year a question? Is how are you doing a question to which I kept answering one minute despair, the same minute delirium, I said, or so I said. Then Lisa and I started climbing the trees to take shelter inside the moons. But then Lisa disappeared. And where did Lisa go? I called her name. She had gone even deeper into the woods and was playing a flute. I followed the sound, but the sound dispersed was everywhere. Last night, for example, we were in a city. 
The streets were steep and covered in moss. We were gliding down the streets. There were cemeteries on every shoulder. Earlier, we were drinking milk. The milk was all over the floor. It was entertainment. We glided down the milk, the moss, I mean, past an enormous house. It was the house where the mother lived. It was made of many boats stacked on top of each other. This is how a millionaire lives, I thought, in a house made of many boats stacked on top of each other and with never ending milk. This is how you sing the words of every book and the words become soft and you hold the softness in your lap and a presence in which all earnings are kept emanates like the cologne of occupation. Earlier, we were on a sheep farm. All the sheep were dead, their bodies denuded, strewn like driftwood. An unseen force was shooting from the sky. This was the day after the executive order. We did not see the sheep being murdered, just as we crashed the woman's house and slid down the moss and the room with milk on the floor and the earth below. The cliff was so narrow, I did not think we were going to make it. There was nothing to hold on to. The cliff was white, the milk dried above the earth was petrified milk, and we were sliding down it. Remember when we walked freely through the seasons? Even then, we could not help but wish we were somewhere else. Last night, for example, in a city, the streets were steep and covered in moss, and there were cemeteries on every shoulder. I had a dream last night that I took my daughter to visit her great-grandfather's grave. When we got there, his grave was gone and had been replaced with an obelisk inscribed with the words Hydra Medusa. My daughter sat down in front of it and closed her eyes. I had a dream last night that my grandfather, upset with the book that I had written about him, attacked me. My grandfather was, when he died, small. He shrunk to less than five feet tall and his arms were skinnier than mine. But he, he had the fortification and the force of all our dead behind him. And they too were upset with the book I'd written. So his attack was their attack. I should have given into it because if their attack was sincere and if it, was, and if it satisfied the extent of their being upset, then I would soon be joining them and become part of that force. And yet I tried to escape. I ran into a building. There was a cafeteria. People were eating at long cafeteria tables. The tables had wheels. My grandfather, catching up to me, started pushing the tables with the people still sitting at them. He started pushing the tables into me. I laid down on the floor, hoping the tables would pass over. I had in my hands, with its spine pressed against my neck, the book I had written about him. I had a dream last night that my grandmother, on her deathbed, pulled me very close to her face and said in a faint, half-broken voice, give away the one you want. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Tacey. Wow, that was extraordinary. I don't quite know what to say. That's just beautiful. So I guess that concludes the reading for this evening. Uh, we'd like you to stay. You're welcome to stay until we usually have a Q&A with the authors and we can do that virtually. Um, and I hope to see you all uh, in March, March 20th at our next reading. Thank you all. Thank you again to our readers. Thank you to all the POG and thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. Thank you. Good seeing you, Cole. Let's go back to gallery view so we can see everybody. Good seeing everybody and wonderful hearing those poems. It's just really extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. It's wonderful hearing your work. Thank you. Yours too. Thank you, Tacey. Yeah.